Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter um, 7 and verse 4. First of all, I want to see that Israel got right with God. The, the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together in Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. They had finally had a right heart towards God. They finally had a right attitude. Often, if you've been away from the Lord for a time, that movement back towards the Lord begins with confession, or begins with Lord, I've sinned. Will you forgive me? D David in Psalm 51, after uh, his sin with Bathsheba and, and murdering uh, her husband, what did he say? He said, he said uh, give me a right spirit. I've sinned before you and you only. Would you have a right spirit come back inside of me? Would you cleanse me from all unrighteousness? This is what David said. And often when you've been away from God and you, you want to come back to him, usually that starts with confession and, and, realize, and, and seeing you seeing yourself from God's point of view. But they were in a very different place in chapter 4. Notice this, this first kind of thought as we're laying the groundwork for this message. This story is the exact opposite in chapter 7 from chapter 4. In chapter 4, Israel went against the Philistines. They went to battle against the Philistines without consulting God. If you want, put your finger from chapter 4 to chapter 7. We're going to flip back and forth. Chapter 4, verse 1. And the, word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel came unto all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines into battle. So in the first battle they lost, Israel was the aggressor. In chapter two, the second, or chapter 7, the second battle, it was the Philistines that were the aggressor. 7, verse 7. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went against Israel. So Israel was the aggressor the first time. Philistines were the aggressor the second time. Notice this also. In the first battle, Israel was confident when they went to battle. Chapter 4, verse 3. When the people were coming to the camp, this is just after they had lost 4,000 men, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us this day before the Lord? Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to skip to the end, it, that it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. They were confident. They were going to go right back to battle. They said, Oh, we just forgot the Lord, grab the ark, we'll go down. And we talked about all the significance of that. They were going to battle, they had the ark, but the Lord's presence, the Lord's blessing had already departed because they were worshiping the ark of God rather than the God of the ark. They went to battle, they were confident. They said, the Lord will deliver us, but he didn't. The second time in chapter 7, second battle, Israel is afraid of the Philistines. First time, they were ready to go. Hey, he's going to deliver us. They cheered when the ark came. But notice at the end of chapter 7, verse 7, they were afraid of the Philistines. In the first battle in chapter 4, the Philistines were the ones who were afraid of Israel. How do I know that? Chapter 4, verse 7, and the Philistines were afraid. Pretty easy, right? The Bible sometimes real hard to understand, right? Uh, in the second battle, the Philistines were the ones who were confident. Chapter 7, verse 10, and Samuel was and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. They said, hey, while the Israelites are doing their God thing, whatever, I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing their offering and they're doing their whatever, let's, let's go get it, uh, an advantage on them. Let's get set and we're going we're gonna to go to battle for them while they're, they're worshiping their God. They were the ones who were confident. They thought they had, they had a, a position of, of, of uh, a victory. In the first battle, God was not with Israel. This is the, the main difference. Everything was, was completely opposite, but the, the number one thing that made the difference was the first time God was not with Israel. Look at chapter 4, verse 22. I'll give you a second to flip there. I know I'm going quickly here. But in chapter 4, verse 22, it says, And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. God was not with Israel in that first battle. And that's why they lost. They lost a battle that they should have won because God was not with them. But then in chapter 7, we see in the second battle that God is with them. The Philistines don't know it yet. They're confident, but they're, they're in for a hurting. They're about to uh, have 
find out what it's like to go up against an army with God on their side. Verse, seven, or verse 8 of chapter 7, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. What a difference God makes. Everything about this story is completely opposite. And the one factor is whether God was with or not with Israel. And that's the same thing in your life. That's what we're going to kind of think about. We're going to make some observations throughout this story now. But the main difference in this story was whether or not God was with Israel. And the main factor that's going to make or break your life, what's going to change your life for the better or worse, is whether or not God is with you. Whether that be for salvation, and maybe you haven't trusted Christ for heaven, and you never even just had a time where you said, I believe what Jesus did for me on the cross. I believe that he came to earth to die for me, to pay for my sins, and that if I tr trust in him and him alone for heaven, then he'll save me. It's to, to, go, to get to heaven, it's not Jesus and anything. It's not Jesus and church attendance. It's not Jesus and baptism. Not Jesus and offering. Jesus and being a good person. Jesus and not hitting my wife. Praise the Lord for that, you know, because I hit her all the time. No, I'm just kidding. It's not Jesus and anything. It's Jesus. That's it. You can't, you can't do anything to save yourself. Going to church is you doing something. Giving is some, you doing something. Being good is you doing something. There's nothing that you can do to, to get to heaven. So you just need to come to the realization that I need G Jesus and Jesus alone in my life for salvation. But maybe you are saved. You have that taken care of. You're on your way to heaven. But you don't have Jesus in your life. You don't, have, you don't allow God to be the one who directs your life. You say, well, I do. I come to church. I'm here, aren't I? I've seen a lot of wicked people come to church. Just be honest. Right? Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian, right? Being in the church building, just like when you go stand in your garage, it doesn't make you a car, right? <laughs> Being in church doesn't make you Christ like. And the difference in your life is going to be whether or not you allow God to come in and you put Him first in your life. You cannot arrive. I'm a math guy, I like math. It's been a while since I've done it now. College is getting further and further away, which is crazy. Um, I can't believe that 10 years since I was a freshman in college already. That's just wild. Um, but you cannot arrive at the solution without factoring in all the variables. If you're, you know, well, some, some of you say, well, I don't, I don't like math. I, 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 quit, I quit paying attention to math whenever there was, you know, imaginary numbers or there was variables, right? X and Y and whatnot. Uh, made me think of this, uh, this guy who wasn't really good at math, but he kind of applied algebra to his relationship. He looked at his ex and wondered why. Uh, <laughs> but some things in your life that God is asking you to do, it doesn't make sense. And you say, I don't see how that's going to add up. Either the finances don't add up or what he's asking me to do doesn't make sense. Have you factored God in? If you're working out a math problem, if you forget to add something, you'll never arrive at the right solution. And when you're working out the problems in your life, if you don't add God, you're never going to arrive at the right solution. Israel lost a battle they should have won without God, but then they won a battle that they should have lost with him. Do you want God in your life? He will make the difference. Now I want to look at some observations now with kind of that theme and thought in mind. First of all, and these rhyme again. It just jumped out at me. I'm not probably always going to do it. Some pastors alliterate. I've been rhyming for some reason. Uh, but first of all, Israel was afraid. Israel was afraid. Chapter 7, verse 7. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, and the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. You are usually most ready to be used of God when you feel least ready. And you are usually least ready to be used of God when you feel most ready. See, that doesn't really make any sense. That doesn't mean that we don't prepare to be used of God. God doesn't use lazy people. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, this is Paul talking about his weakness. He said, 
At least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. I wonder what that was. Was that an infirmity that came to him? Or maybe it was a person, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. Say, that's my wife. I know who that is. You know. It sounded funnier in my mind. Anyways, <laughs> maybe I should have said husband. That would have, that would have landed better. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should exa be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, this is God talking to Paul now, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. This is Paul talking now. He said, I'm going to give praise to the Lord, not for the gifts necessarily that he gave me, not for the incredible talents that I have. I'm going to be thankful for the things that are looked at as weaknesses, the things that are infirmities. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, talking about things that I have to do, eat, sleep, Say, I wish I could do more to help, but I have to care for my family. I have to sleep. Necessities. In persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The weaker you get in your strength, if you're relying on the Lord, really the stronger you get. You will be stronger in your weakest points as a human if you have the Lord's strength with you then you will be when you're, you're the strongest in your strength and you don't have the Lord with you. I, Israel figured that out. Israel was afraid and they said, we can't beat the Philistines. And they were right. They couldn't. But they had God on their side, so therefore they could. Paul said, I'd rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, my afflictions, the things that are looked on as negative things because there God's glory shines through. Israel was not trusting in their strength anymore. Who are you trusting in? This morning. Are you trusting in yourself? Say, I, I hear this sometimes. I'll go knock on a door. Hey, Pastor Drew Rogers, I'm the new pastor at Rogers City Baptist Church, just out meeting people. I want to give you some information about our church. I'll say this a lot. I'm good. You're good? The Bible says there's none good. I mean, so, but you're not good. None of us are good on our own. We all, the very next breath that you draw, into your nostrils or mouth, depending on if you're a mouth breather or not. The next air that you bring into your lungs comes from God. Without him, he doesn't have to kill you. He just has to stop giving you life. We rely on literally God for, we rely on God for literally everything. So we, so many times in our life, we just say, I'm good. I got this, you know. Just maxed out my, you know, contributions, my Roth for this year, you know. If something were to happen, I could always pull it out. You know, I'm fine. I'm not fine. No, I'm good. We're one phone call away. We're one away from... Who are you trusting in? Israel was finally trusting in God again. Number two, not only was Israel afraid, Israel prayed. Chapter 7, verse 8. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. The, in chapter 4, they had been in battle. They had been chased down, and there was a great slaughter. They saw what it was like when God wasn't with them. They were afraid of going to battle without God again. They said, don't stop praying for us. And that's where it's at. And Samuel took a sucking lamb, uh, that means just a young a lamb, and offered it to, as a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. So many times I hear there's a situation that's just crazy, right? A car accident, and, you know, a, a whole family is wiped out. Or, you know, just that big, you know, crazy thing that, that you never want to hear about. And I hear all the, all the time people will say, well, you know, they're states away. There's really you know, nothing I can do for them physically. I don't have a lot of money. I can't give for them. Well, I, the least I can do is pray. I hate that statement. That's not the least that you can do. Prayer is the most that you can do. Prayer really should be the first thing 
that we do. But so often when something happens, we say, oh my goodness, can you believe, you know, and we get on the horn and we call our friends or we text and, you know, get on Facebook, you know, with a sad face, hashtag struggling today, you know. That's not the first thing that we should do. The first thing that we should do is get on our knees and say, God, I need your help. Cease not to pray. That's what Israel said. They said, we're in a tough spot. We're in a bind here. Don't stop praying for us. And the beautiful thing is, it says that God heard them. God promises that he will hear our prayers. I, oh, this, oh, yeah, this is the time. Will you throw that song up? I wanted to sing this song. I love this. Uh, this is a new chorus. This is all you Wednesday nighters. This is our time to shine, okay? We worked on, we worked on this chorus specifically um, to, to, to sing for this, um, this part in the message. And uh, so sing it out nice and loud. It's a chorus that goes like this. Prayer moves the heart, then moves the hand, then moves the world. When he hears his children's voice, the very heart of God is stirred. He has promised he will answer. We can take him at his word. Prayer moves the heart, that moves the hand, that moves the world. We're going to sing it a couple more times. When you pray, you are talking to the God who created everything. The world and everything that's in it. The Bible says we were talking about specifically on Wednesday night how um, from a, like a governmental standpoint. It says that the, the king's heart is in the, the hand, and, and if, if God wants to move the king's heart, he can. If he wants uh, Joe Biden all of a sudden to, to, to start thinking again and, and do some things good for our country, he can do that. But he also, he also has control over what's happening right now. But we're talking to the God who is the king of kings, we sing it, we say all the time, King of kings, Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. But do we really believe it? Do we really believe that we are talking to the King of kings, the creator of the universe? When we pray, we're talking to the most powerful, the most all-knowing, fill in the blank. He's the most, he's the mostest. And that's what we're talking to. Prayer moves the heart, that moves the hand, that moves the world. Let's sing it a couple more times. Prayer moves the heart, that moves the hand, that moves the world. When he hears his children's voice, the very heart of God is stirred. He has promised he will answer. We can take him at his word. Prayer moves the heart, then moves the hand, then moves the world. One more time and then we'll continue on, but I love this. I hope it, uh, you sing this throughout the week. There's, it's a, there's a full song that goes along with it. For those of you old-timers, it was sung by the Inspirations, old-time gospel. I said the 70s, and it offended some people, because I don't think it was that long ago. But I said anything after 1990s are relevant to me anyways. It's all, you're just all ancient, model. anyway. What was it back then, maybe in the 80s or 90s? I think this is like the 90s. Okay, but in, a long time ago. Uh, like right when I was born, so... Uh, but uh, you can look it up on YouTube and they do a better job than me, but I love the words and the chorus of the song. Prayer moves the heart, then moves the hand, then moves the world. When he hears his children's voice, the very heart of God is stirred. He has promised he will answer. We can take him at his word. Prayer moves the heart, that moves the hand, that moves the world. So that's where Israel finally was. They were finally at a place where they got their hearts right. They figured out that they needed God. They figured out that prayer was the absolute best thing that they could do at this point. So that comes to number three. Not only were they afraid, not only did they pray, but number three, the Philistines paid. Verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. That means to put them in confusion. Uh, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines. They didn't just beat them and holler retreat. And they started hightailing it back to their camp. Whenever there was a time in that battle where they pursued, that means that they had the upper hand enough to where they were going to go. They weren't going to go back to camp, regroup, 
go in for another battle. It means that like the battle was over. Israel was going all the way back home. Wee, 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 all the way home. And, uh, and the, the Israelites pursued them. They chased them down, and they were going to kill every single one of them. That's what it means when they pursued them. And smote them until they came into, under Bethkar. When you go against God, looking at it from the Philistines' perspective now, when you're going against God, you're, you're really o- you don't really only take two positions with God. You're either for him or you're against him. You say, well, I'm just going to take a neutral position. A neutral position is against him. If you're not for him, you're against him. So if you go against God, what does that look like? You'll lose every time. When you go against God, you will pay like the Philistines did. Pay him back with interest. I wrote a little poem about fighting against God. You ready? Don't fight against God, dummy. That's it. Don't fight against God. It's a battle that you will lose. It's a hard battle. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 5, this is Paul on the way to Damascus, on Damascus Road. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul was a raving pagan. He was trying, he was literally dragging Christians to be slaughtered, to be burned, to be beheaded, to be sawn asunder. It's exactly what it sounds like, cut in half, to be tortured. Paul was doing that. And on his way, he he met Jesus. And Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? Talking about the, the, the Holy Spirit's prodding and saying, Paul, you need to serve me. Paul, you need to stop what you're doing. It's a hard battle when you're fighting against the Lord. The Bible says the way of the transgressor, meaning someone who's going against God's law, the way of the transgressor is hard. I come across a lot of people every week that call me, Pastor, you know, does your church give out money? Does your church, do they help out with this, that, and the other? I have no problem helping people who need a hand up. But oftentimes, people are in a position because they have refused for so long to do what God has told them to do, and it's taken them to a place where they have no, nothing. The Bible says they're in the hog pen, so to speak, like the prodigal son. Why are they there? Because the way of the transgressor is hard. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, and my burden's light. I don't know about you, I'm a hard worker, but if there's an easier way to do something, I'm all about it. You know, if there's a way to not have dad drop the, bun, you know, the pallet of shingles at the bottom of the roof and say, will you carry him up the ladder for me? If there's a way just to have him take him up to the top, I'm good with that, right? And Jesus said, my yoke's easy. I'm all about that. If you go against God, it's tough. It's a tough life. Get ready, buckle up, put your mouthpiece in, your helmet, strap in, because it's going to be a rough, rough ride. It's a losing battle. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. If you're fighting against God, you already lost. You're fighting a losing battle. We're not fighting for victory as a Christian. We're fighting from victory. We already know what the end is. Satan and all his cronies are going to hell forever. We're going to heaven forever. It's already set in stone. Don't fight against God. Don't fight against God. It's a losing battle. But we see here, not only were the Israelites afraid, Not only did the Israelites pray, then the Philistines paid. Number four, we see God's aid. 7 verse 12, Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Ebenezer means stone of help in the Hebrew. Stone of help. Samuel wanted them to remember that it was God who won the victory. Say, how could they forget? We forget really fast, don't we? My wife and I, we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for to have children. Now we've got three in three years. And it can be, you say, how would you ever forget that miracle? It can happen really quick. The kids say, you know, have, you know it's, a, it's a rough day, you know, and everyone, you know, the kids are potty training right now. And I thought having a dog was the most poop I would ever see on the floor. Nope. Three toddlers. And it's just a tough, you know, I'm having flashbacks right now. I'm having trouble just focusing right now. I'm just PTSD, man. But it can be so easy to get caught up in all of the the peripherals like that and forget three years ago, we were begging God for that. And you say, how would Israel forget? Well, Samuel knew that 
Israel was probably going to forget. And if we look in the chapter 8, the next message is about it. The rest of Samuel's days, they pretty much served the Lord. They had peace in Israel. But then they go right back into, we want a king. And all that brought. Israel forgot. So Samuel set up a remembrance, a stone, to remind them that it was God that had won the victory. So many times it's so easy for us to say, God, would you please help? God, would you please help? Out of a right heart, out of a right attitude. God helps us and say, thanks, God. All right, look at what I did. Man, my life is awesome again. And you completely forget him. And then the only time that we go back to him is when we need something again, when the next emergency happens. We use God just like a vending machine. Oh, I'm all out of blessings, God. A1, ba-choom. Oh, thank you. God's not a vending machine. He's not a blessing machine. God is to be worshipped in the good times and bad. We need him just as much in the good times as the bad. The stone was a stone of remembrance to remind them that God had helped them in the past. It was a stone of recognition, helping them to remember that God had helped them today. And it was a stone of revelation that God would help them in the future. Mm -hmm. Ebenezer, stone of help. We can all look back at times when God has helped us. Like uh, Joshua said, um, in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you whom, whom this day whom you will serve, whether the gods, which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua remembered what the Lord had done for him, and he knew that he had helped him, he was helping him, and he was going to be helping him. How's that for your English there? <laughs> Past is was word, right? Me being Ben. David, Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of his enemy. David knew something about being saved from the hand of his enemy, did he not? We all have times in our life where we can look back and say, Thank you, Lord. Ebenezer, stone of remembrance. Lastly, Israel was afraid. Israel prayed. Philistines paid. God's aid. Israel is remade. Verse 13, So the Philistines were subdued. They came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Israel. That's what I'm talking about. Your enemies, having God's hand against your enemies. I like that. And, uh, and, the, Phil and the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even unto Gath, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Notice this. This is what happened in Israel, but think of this in context to your life. There was no longer oppression from the enemy. They regained the land that was rightfully theirs, and there was peace at home. Does that sound like what you want? Do you want victory over the enemy? We know who our enemy is, Satan. Do you want victory over him? Do you want to regain? They say, well, you know, I wish that I could go back to a time when, and you can name a time or a, a place where you felt like you were closer to God, you were more spiritual than you are right now. I wish I could go back there. Do you want to regain that ground? Do you want to have peace at home? Say, oh, I just want peace. With whoever, whatever. That's exactly what Israel got. Why? Because they were afraid. They finally realized that it was not them that was going to say that it was him. But that's for salvation, and that's for your life in general. They prayed. The older I get, the more things that I'm privy to, the more I realize I, just, I need the Lord's help. I know. I knew a whole lot more when I graduated from high school than I do now. I tell you that much. I knew a whole lot more when I got out of college. Well, I'm going to fix this, that, and the other. You know, I saw this thing the other day. It said when I, when I was single, I had, a, uh, I had like, no, no family and six philosophies on raising children. Now I have six children and no philosophies. It's, right? So you just realize you don't even know what you don't know. And I just know that I need him. That's it. Israel was afraid. Israel prayed. And then we see God's aid. And that's where it's at. And God will give us his aid. God will give us the victory in whatever area it is in your life if we're willing to give him first place and pray. 
You see, that seems so simple. It is. But why don't we do it? Because we forget. Because we get puffed up in our own pride. Because we get too busy. And really, sometimes we just got to put away all the peripherals, do like the horses do, and we'll put the blinders on and just focus on what's most important. Seek Him and pray. Seek Him and pray. What, it, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to witness to today? That's it. So, you want victory in your life? Do you want the Lord's blessing? Do you want to regain that ground? Give Him the respect He deserves. Put Him first place. Pray, and He will help you.